thank you all for uh, joining this afternoon. Um, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking a little bit about NCCN's journey. All of you, I think, are familiar with the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, or NCCN. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about their activities around COVID and COVID vaccination. The problem that we're going to talk about today that we've all been confronted with is how best to use a limited vaccine supply to maximally benefit our cancer patients. And we'll talk about that in steps. Um, the NCCN formed uh, a COVID task force, which I've been part of in March of last year. Um, in the spring, we met every week. We met a little bit less frequently over the summer and then started to meet more frequently in the fall. Uh, and that allowed the 30 NCCN centers to get together and talk a little bit about what they were doing at each of the centers since there was very little data out there to tell us what to do. Um, and I found this extremely helpful, and we all brought back uh, to our institutions uh, what we had learned at those sessions. When COVID vaccines became available and it appeared that they would be available for cancer patients, we rapidly formed uh, an NCCN COVID-19 Vaccination Advisory Committee, which I also had the privilege of serving on, on January 11th, uh, and it was pulled together literally with 24 hours notice. We had two chairs, Steve Bergham and Lindsay Baden, both infectious disease specialists, Steve from the Hutch and Lindsay Bagan from Dana-Farber Brigham Women's Cancer Center. And there was a broad membership on the advisory committee, including bioethicists, which turned out, I think, to be very important. We worked um, pretty hard, and 11 days after we first met, we completed guidelines in NCCN vaccination, which I'll talk about, and posted it on the NCCN website on January 22nd. We stated at the beginning that it was meant to be a living document that we would alter as new data became available, and in fact, in the document had the quote, due to limitation in prospective data relating to vaccination use, in patients with active malignancy, recommendations are based on the expert opinion of the committee. And that's just acknowledging the fact that we were making recommendations with, unfortunately, very little data. What did we um, know about how to prioritize our patients? Well, the National Academies had come out with a risk stratification for equitable allocation of COVID vaccine. And they had four criteria, the risk of infection, comorbidities, negative social impact, and the risk of transmission to others. The NCCN modified those risk factors and said, in addition, the cancer-specific factors, the patient age, the patient comorbidities, and social and demographic factors that included poverty, limited access to health care, and under, underrepresented minorities should all be taken into consideration. I will say that we spent uh, a long time talking about a number of both practical and ethical considerations. And as I mentioned, uh, we had um, bioethicists uh, on the committee with us. And we asked questions, and these are just two examples. Do you vaccinate high-risk patients? And the hemologic malignancy patients are most high-risk though their chances for a good response to the vaccine might not be great. Patients who have hemologic malignancies or those who are receiving anti-CD20 therapies such as rituximab. Uh, do you vaccinate patients at highest risk, even if their life expectancy is short, or do you vaccinate patients at lower risk with the higher likelihood of long-term survival? You might have a patient with advanced lung cancer who Projected survival might be measured in several months, might be older with comorbidities, and is at extremely high risk to die from COVID if he were to become infected. But then you have a patient with testicular cancer, young patient, 25 years old, who is very low risk or moderately low risk to die of COVID, but has an excellent long-term prognosis. How do you best use limited vaccine? We acknowledge, as I mentioned, that the bat, there was really no good vaccine data on cancer patients on active therapy, uh, and we had an obligation to generate those data, and we are trying to do that. We did say that there were no obvious safety concerns for cancer patients receiving the vaccine, and the efficacy of vaccination 
in different cancer populations was unknown. So we made the statement that patients with active cancer on active treatment are at increased risk for complications and should be prioritized. We wanted a simple and rapid approach to vaccination, and uh, Lynn and Lindsay are going to talk about the PEN approach, um, and it's important for it to be agile and fast. And we wanted to include racial and ethnic minorities and other high-risk groups. We also made the statement that caregivers and household contacts should be considered for early vaccination, but they were not prioritized along with the cancer patients. But obviously, we didn't want people bringing COVID into the home. Now, you know, with an unlimited supply of vaccine, everybody should be vaccinated tomorrow, and I think we would all agree with that. But the degree of availability of vaccine will affect the prioritization specifics. And that was different for every medical center and every cancer center around the U.S. We all agreed that vaccine should not be wasted. Um, if you had available vaccine, it had been thought it needs to be used, and you had patients there, they should be vaccinated. The vaccine should make it into their arms. And the sooner patients are vaccinated, the better. We also had an appreciation that for some centers like Penn, which is a matrix cancer center, we would need to share priorities with non-cancer patients, patients who had undergone solid organ transplant or who had other immunological disorders. So this is the chart that the NCCN came up with, and they divided the patients up into those with hematologic malignancies and solid tumors. For the hematologic malignancies and acute myeloid leukemia induction, they said you should wait until ANC recovery. And the reason they said that was not because of fear of vaccinating with a low acute, um, um, absolute neutrophil count, but the fact that their lymphocytic immune system was also greatly suppressed during this time. Likewise, for transplants or CAR-T patients, they recommended waiting at least three months post-transplant for recovery of immunological function. For marrow failure states like uh, MDS, they said vaccine available. And for all others, including patients who are on drugs like rituximab, vaccinate when vaccine available. For the solid tumor malignancies, anybody receiving cytotoxic chemotherapy should be prioritized. Those patients receiving targeted therapies should be prioritized. Patients receiving immunotherapy, such as checkpoint inhibitors, should be prioritized, and those receiving radiation should also be prioritized. Now, there were a few uh, considerations that we also spoke about. We felt that solid tumor patients should be re vaccinated regardless of where in the chemotherapy cycle that they are. We didn't think that it, and there was any data to say that it made a difference. They could be vaccinated on the treatment day, during their nadir, even with thrombocytopenia. We do bone marrows in patients with thrombocytopenia. We ought to be able to stick a very small needle into somebody's arm. The patient is there and vaccine is available, vaccinate, and don't take into consideration, well, they're going to finish their chemotherapy in another four weeks, maybe we should wait. We recommended vaccinating as soon as vaccine was available for them. As I mentioned, for patients with hematologic malignancies, drugs like rituximab should not be a contraindication, though we were not certain about what the responses would be, and likewise with, malia, with marrow failure states. We also addressed clinical trials, and we felt like unless there was a very specific scientific reason that uh, for not to vaccinate, the patients enrolled in clinical trials should be offered vaccination, and vaccination should not be an eligibility disqualifier for enrollment in a trial. Now, clearly, um, these factors needed to be negotiated with the sponsors of the trials, but we felt quite strongly about this and made the statement. So what's happened nationally? Well, vaccine supplies, as you know from reading the paper, have varied greatly by state, by county, by city, and that's true in Pennsylvania as well. And rules have varied greatly by state and county and city. And when we talk to our colleagues in New York or Utah or California, uh, government regulations have a lot to say about who can be vaccinated and when, and we have to fit our priorities and our uh, schedules around that. The logistics are complicated and everyone's doing their best, and Lynn and Lindsay are going to talk about the logistics. 
And vaccination rates and who is getting vaccinated has varied greatly, again, from state to state and even within states from county to county. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lynn, who's going to talk about um, our experience at Penn and how we've uh, sorted out uh, the details and move forward. Lynn? Thanks, Larry, and thank you all for joining us today. Actually, I did, I, I haven't read the details, but I understand that there's been assessment of how states are doing at rolling out their vaccine programs and uh, the data on Pennsylvania is not so great. So I think we have a lot of work to do about getting this vaccine out to our patients. Uh, so I really wanna focus on the safety and the recommendation that our patients with cancer should be receiving the COVID-19 vaccine. Next slide. The goal is, and as, as, as Larry mentioned, is to vaccinate as many patients as quickly as we can, um, but we have to follow actually really, you know, pretty strict guidelines about where the vaccine is being distributed, vaccine availability. As you know, there's different storage requirements. Um, the Pfizer vaccine requires very specific freezer storage, and so not every site can handle the Pfizer vaccine. The Moderna vaccine has different storage, and it makes it more available at community sites and other sites that don't, you know, not based at a hospital. Um, we have a, 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 a way we're vaccinating here at our site is with some staff, but a lot of volunteers. And so this is logistically, as Lindsay will go through, um, quite a challenge to get thousands of patients through the doors each day. Next slide. So in Pennsylvania and New Jersey, um, the guidelines say for people over 65, they would qualify in general for the COVID-19 vaccine. But in addition, people with cancer are on that list. And then patients who have an immunocompromised system because of prior treatment, you know, prior therapies that are on high dose steroids. And then we've included, and Philadelphia has included sickle cell disease um, as um, a high risk group and sickle cell patients are high risk because their spleens don't function well and so they are at increased risk for infection. Next slide. Um, and then these are, next slide shows the guidelines in Philadelphia, which is a different age, um, and, but then cancer is also listed. So the important work that NCCN did and then what we've looked here at Penn is to try to say, well, if you just said cancer patients, um, that denominator is quite large. And so then even within cancer, it's important to prioritize who are the patients at greatest risk here that we should prioritize the vaccine because it is limited supply. Um, and so how the prioritization works really is who are the patients, not that are increased risk for getting COVID, but really there's now emerging data over this past year about which patients with cancer have the highest risk of complications from COVID. So complications meaning needing for oxygen, requiring hospitalization and the increased mortality. So the NCCN guidelines and our own guidelines that we've developed here at Abramson Cancer Center is really taking into account who's at greatest risk for complications of the virus. Um, so the next slide. So as we've looked at the data, um, and Larry actually just spoke to this, but it is any patient with cancer over age 65, because older people, and now I mean, I'm almost in this group, but are at greater risk for complications of COVID um, than anybody on active therapy. So that's regardless of stage, but if somebody is on active treatment, important to um, offer vaccine um, to this group of patients before somebody say is a 10 year survivor from breast cancer, or maybe on hormonal therapy. Patients with advanced cancer metastatic disease have also been shown in many studies to have increased complications from COVID. So these are a group of patients that are really high risk and we would prioritize. Then in general, patients with heme malignancy, regardless of treatment, should be prioritized to receive the vaccine. This is again because patients with heme malignancy, patients with CLL, even who are not on active treatment, have B cell dysfunction and are at greatest risk for complications. And then many studies have looked at patients with lung cancer. This could be related to underlying lung disease or prior radiation therapy, but patients in general with lung cancer seem to be a higher risk. 
So these are the group of patients that we've identified as highest risk that as we're rolling out invitations for a vaccine, we would prioritize this group. And then as I also mentioned, we are also doing a lot of outreach to our patients with sickle cell and actually thalassemia, it's the same issue. Next slide. So this is what, you know, we all wanna be speaking with the same voice, which is to say that this COVID vaccine, vaccine the two that are FDA approved thus far are safe. Now, of course, we are saying to patients as we're enrolling them that this is approved through the emergency use authorization. So this is early access. It hasn't had the full FDA approval. That takes many more months and longer follow-up. Um, but it's through the EUA um, emergency use authorization that this vaccine is available and that we think this is safe and that we are strongly recommending it to our patients who have cancer. And this is, as Larry just showed, is supported by national guidelines. We're emphasizing patients on active therapy. Now the question is, is the vaccine gonna be as effective as patients who, with patients who are on chemotherapy? Certainly chemotherapy, steroids suppress the immune system. Um, where we've studied this, we've actually had extensive studies in patients who are getting flu vaccine. So we've evaluated patients getting flu vaccine who are on chemotherapy or immunotherapy, and their, their response to flu vaccine seems to be um, quite robust. So, but it's possible that in patients who are you know, severely um, compromised because of treatment that their immune response won't be as robust. But still, whatever um, response is, uh, occurs is predicted to be of benefit. And as Larry said, said, there's no issue about the timing of getting the vaccine in relationship to treatment. So there is no, you should get it not when you're um, getting the same day of treatment or trying to uh, predict at a nadir. We have given flu vaccine, and I'm sure you have, to many patients who are getting treatment that day and get the flu vaccine. And we have the experience already of giving this vaccine to many patients who are getting the vaccine same day as treatment. There are a few exclusion criteria. So in general, there's a recommendation that individuals who've had a prior COVID-19 infection, they should wait 90 days before receiving the vaccine. And that's CDC guidance. In part, this is that these patients who've had a COVID-19 infection really are protected and so don't need the vaccine right now. And so making the vaccine available to others. And Keith Hamilton mentioned to us today, who's an infectious disease, there may be some preliminary data that the response to the vaccine and people who've had recent infection may not be as robust. So in general, when possible, we wait till 90 days after documented COVID-19 infection. And then there are certain caveats around patients getting bone marrow transplant and CAR T cell in terms of waiting. You know, in general, for people who've had an allo transplant, we do wait a certain number of weeks or months before we give them their new vaccines because they're immune systems are not capable. So there's specific guidance around timing of the vaccine in people who've had a bone marrow transplant or CAR T cell. And then there's general guidance, again, from the CDC that people who are having and have major surgery should wait two weeks after their surgery day to receive the vaccine. Next slide. So Many of you have received the vaccine, so you know firsthand the side effects. But just to run through this, because this is important as we're educating our patients, this vaccine is reactogenic. So when people get the vaccine, they can have side effects, but that is actually showing that their immune system is working. So there are local reactions, which is pain and tenderness at the injection site, but there are systemic reactions. And this is more than flu vaccine. So fever, occurs and fever occurs commonly after the second dose. This temperature can be 101, 102. It does seem that younger people are having more of this febrile response, but fever, headache, being, you know, malaise, muscle pain. And I do think this is important to mention, lymphadenopathy is really being reported. And I had a patient text me last night, she had her second dose of vaccine on Friday. She had the vaccine in her left arm. She had an enlarged lymph node under her left arm, and she was freaking out that it was recurrence of her cancer. Um, and we've had, many of our nurses have experienced the same thing. So this can happen. 
it, it's the same arm where the vaccine generally is administered. These side effects will disappear within, you know, a day or two of getting the vaccine and they can start roughly about 12 hours after the vaccine. We don't recommend that people get pre-medicated. So we don't recommend that people get Tylenol or Motrin non-steroidals prior to a vaccine. But if they do develop symptoms of, um, from the vaccine, it's safe to take Tylenol or Motrin if otherwise it's safe for them to take it. It doesn't interfere with the success of the vaccine. As I said, reactions occur most commonly after the second dose. And still, anaphylaxis is really rare. Millions of doses have been administered at this point. There have been 31 cases, and all those uh, people have recovered. Next slide. And this was just last week that there was a report of ITP, so immune thrombocytopenia, uh, whether it followed a COVID-19 vaccine. So this question was raised, could the vaccine cause ITP? You know, there was that sentinel event that occurred. There was a physician in Florida who received the vaccine and um, several days later had a drop in his platelet count. So this is what we know, um, and this is information from Adam Sucker, who runs our benign heme section, that as of January 31st, there were 36 cases of ITP reported into this U.S. Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System following the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine. And Adam points out that ITP is common, and there are the incidence is six cases per 100,000, and doing a back of the envelope type calculation, about 33 million people have already received one dose of the vaccine. We would expect in this time frame to receive at least 2,000, or excuse me, to have seen at least 2,000 cases of ITP. So it's not clear that this vaccine is causing ITP. Some of these reports of ITP have happened within days of getting the vaccine, and that's not what the biology is of ITP. When ITP follows a drug, or a vaccine, it typically takes weeks to develop antiplatelet IgG antibodies. So I would say there's more work to do, and um, Adam Sucher's recommendations, and we agree with him, is that in the meantime, we can say if um, ITP, um, if COVID vaccine causes ITP, it's extremely rare, but it's certainly not clear that there's a causal relationship at this point. And clearly, the risk benefit is in favor of receiving vaccine and risk of dying from COVID infection far outweighs this potential risk of ITP. Next slide. So just a couple of other things about education for our patients. So in particular, this issue of fever and chills. So we have seen a lot of fever in our staff and in our colleagues. So this is particularly an issue in our patients on chemotherapy who might develop a fever related to maybe a low white blood cell count and, you know, from their chemotherapy. So we certainly want people to report in fever if they could be at risk for getting an infection related to the treatment that they're on. And we just need to counsel those patients. So in a patient who could be neutropenic, who received the vaccine and develops a fever, we may need to bring them in for evaluation, even though it could be very likely that that febrile event was related to the vaccine. Some patients would still require evaluation, check their white blood cell count, make sure there's no infection. So we certainly did not say that everybody, all of our cancer patients who develop a fever should call us, but certainly if there's any concern or they're on chemotherapy and concern about a potential infection, they should give us a call. What about patients with low platelet count? We are not screening patients for platelets counts before they get the vaccine. Um, and so the volume of the injection is quite low. So we're not checking that and we think it's safe. You know, if someone's gonna have a brief period of thrombocytopenia and you want to wait a week, that's certainly fine. Just that we don't know when these invitations come available, either at the county level, you know, at a drugstore or at the um, you know, health system, so, you know, better to say yes and grab that. There may be specific concerns in patients with sickle cell. There were reports in some of our staff who have sickle cell who received the vaccine that may precipitate a pain crisis. They may need additional blood transfusion. So if you have additional questions about sickle cell patients that may be in your community, I've included Farzana 
Sayani's email here. She um, directs our sickle cell program and she's happy to walk through this with you. But she's really recommending vaccine for our patients with sickle cell and thalassemia. Next slide. So the most important point, this is my final slide, is to say that this is showing you the efficacy data of the vaccine and highlighted in yellow, the purpose of people getting this vaccine is that it is protecting people from need for hospitalizations and death. And you compare the placebo or treatment arms and these vaccines are incredibly effective in preventing serious complications of COVID. And so I think they're very similar between Moderna and Pfizer, you know, after the Pfizer vaccine, you have about 50 to 60% protection after the first dose, and about 98% protection after the second dose. Um, but the important thing, and why we're strongly recommending the COVID vaccine, is that it really is protecting from hospitalizations and death. And important that we also mention that for our patients, when they get the vaccine, it's still important for them to maintain precautions. They still need to wear a mask. They still need to maintain social distancing. And so this is really important. We're going to get emerging data about which vaccine might be more effective against different variants. But that's an important part of the education is that even if vaccinated, patients still need to wear a mask. So I'm going to end there, and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Lindsay Zink. Thanks, Lynn. So, hi, everyone. I'm going to be talking to you about uh, how we actually implemented oncology patient vaccinations at Penn. Um, so, really, during the end of January, we began a 10-day uh, soft pilot for oncology patients to be able to receive their COVID vaccination at the Perlman Center for Advanced Medicine. And that's our uh, outpatient facility that's really located across the street from uh, the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, where our cancer center location at the Perlman Center is located. And so uh, the purpose of the pilot was really to be able to test our 15th floor of the Perlman Center, which is really a non-clinical location um, that has been being utilized for employee vaccination since December. Uh, the purpose of the pilot was to test that location as a potential site for mass patient vaccination at Penn. Um, just to paint the picture of the backdrop for the pilot, it was uh, quite the burning platform due to concerns about maintaining our supply from the city. Uh, we had less than 24 hours to plan and implement the pilot from the time we were notified of the ability to vaccinate patients uh, to the time that we actually administered our first dose of vaccine to a cancer patient at Penn uh, all in. It was uh, probably closer to 12 12 hours uh, to prepare. So we had to really assemble a very large multidisciplinary team to quickly engage in super rapid implementation planning. Um, obviously, as you can imagine, much of this was on the fly. We had a really um, a lot of need for quick turnaround from a data perspective as well as an education perspective. Um, and all the while we were sort of approaching this pilot trying to plan for longer term uh, sustainability and turnover of the operations to a more centralized management system. Uh, our infusion nursing leadership was really critical um, in this process and uh, there was a team of nurses that were helping to lead the uh, rapid planning and patient education and coordination as well as the implementation efforts. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. And the next one. Um, so we essentially started the soft pilot process with a manual invitation process to invite patients to receive the vaccine. And this was because our electronic scheduling uh, and our EMR department builds actually weren't, weren't live in the system for this type of scheduling. And so we began on the first day really in, engaging in targeted uh, patient outreach with the patients that we thought would be most likely to come in on uh, such short notice, which was really just starting with verbal invitations in the infusion suite with treatment patients that were already here uh, for a treatment visit. And I think this worked well because obviously we were targeting some of our highest risk, most vulnerable patients that were on active treatment and they were also already here, um, but we very quickly realized that we were not going to be able to fill all of our vaccine slots with that approach. So we quickly progressed to a phone call outreach for a broader group of high-risk cancer patients that are living in Philadelphia. 
And so this manual invitation process was really a collaborative effort between leadership, the providers and their care teams. Um, and basically what we did is we would have providers identify lists of their patients who lived in Philadelphia and met the criteria. And then they or someone on their care team, either their APP or their administrative assistant or their RN uh, would call the patient to determine whether or not they would be interested in receiving the vaccine. Um, and then from there, we actually centralize um, the pilot scheduling to a core group of individuals who would contact the patient to be able to facilitate getting their, uh, their first vaccine here at Penn, should they be able to come in and meet the specific criteria. Um, in terms of our eligibility criteria for the soft pilot, unfortunately, due to restrictions from the city uh, related to our supply from the city, patients did have to be residents of Philadelphia to participate in the pilot. Um, so the criteria that we established established collaboratively for the pilot was that patients had to, number one, be residents of Philadelphia, um, also have cancer or sickle cell, plus any one of the following. And you can see them listed there. It was either age over 65, metastatic solid tumor, lung cancer patients, key malignancy, or uh, any treatment, systemic therapy, or radiation treatment within 90 days. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please. So just to provide a little context of our vaccination site at the Perlman Center, as I mentioned previously, our 15th floor is a non-clinical area. And so this largely consists of administrative offices and conference space, um, but it's been being effectively utilized every day since early December as a, as a mass employee vaccination site. Uh, we are able to vaccinate about 800 employees uh, per day at, at this particular location. Our projected daily patient capacity, which was part of what we were trying to test during the pilot, was about 400 patients per day. Um, so you were roughly able to do about half as many patients as you are employees at this vaccination site due to all the things you would imagine. There's just additional time related to, you know, increased amount of comorbidities and other health conditions with patients compared to employees, as well as um, transportation needs, monitoring needs, et cetera. Um, and it is staffed by a variety of uh, roles across all levels. So there is entity leadership there every day. There's a, a variety of care team members that staff the site, physicians, advanced practice providers, nurses, front desk staff and medical assistants. Um, we have repurposed a lot of nurses that are in non-direct uh, care roles. They've been pulled from their home units in order to staff this space. Um, and we're also relying heavily on uh, pharmacy staff as well as nursing students and college volunteers to staff the space. In terms of the types of roles in the clinic, um, there are a variety of roles. So there is obviously a check-in and a check-out area um, immediately for uh, when you arrive into the, into the unit. From there, you're taken to a consenting station uh, where patients or employees are then consented and have an opportunity to have their questions answered. Um, from there, you progress to the next uh, sort of phase of the layout, and that's where you're actually uh, vaccinated uh, by a nurse or by a pharmacist. Um, and then from there, you go into a monitoring room, and there are clinical monitors who circulate the room um, and monitor for reactions, as well as schedule your uh, follow-up appointment for your second vaccination. And then we also have this critically important role of the flow monitor there. And so those individuals um, are typically tend to be leadership volunteers who are helping monitor uh, the flow through the entire space. You can go to the next slide, please. So in terms of our results, we vaccinated about 280 patients during the 10-day pilot. Um, other areas, just to give a little context, that participated in the pilot were patients from renal, uh, solid organ transplant, as well as primary care. And we found that about 70% of our cancer patients accepted a vaccine appointment, and we were really impressed with that. It seemed to be, uh, number one, much higher than we anticipated, and also much higher than the acceptance rate that we were observing in the other specialty areas that were participating in the pilot. Uh, we did include treatment patients for both medical oncology as well as radiation oncology, um, and we also included patients from our other downtown hospitals, such as Penn Presbyterian and Pennsylvania Hospital. I think overall the soft pilot was very successful. 
Um, our biggest wins, I think, were that we were able to prove that this employee vaccination site was actually a very effective location for patients. Um, it really has been incredible um, in terms of the flow and the efficiency of the operations. And our patients and providers were just thrilled to be having the opportunity to vaccinate patients so much earlier than we had anticipated, um, given that this was uh, all occurring at the end of January. Um, it was also a really great chance to start to evaluate some of the really complex clinical questions that were arising, um, and I'll sort of outline uh, those next. So in terms of the challenges that we identified or sort of the lessons learned during the pilot, um, patient navigation was and continues to be somewhat of a challenge. Um, as I mentioned, our 15th floor is non-clinical, and so it is not easy to find. Um, many patients do need escorts um, to, to make their way up to this location. It's quite far from our cancer center location, even though it's still in the building. Uh, so we've had to work a lot on patient wayfinding, both from a volunteer perspective as well as a signage perspective. Um, there's also a lot of complex scheduling coordination for cancer patients. So uh, for a cancer patient in terms of their vaccination, you know, the ideal time to schedule would be after their clinic visit. That way they would have would have the opportunity to talk to their provider first um, about vaccination. And then ideally we try not to send them in between clinic and infusion, um, just because of the concern that if they are to be delayed in the vaccination area, they could theoretically miss their infusion. Um, but then the downside to that is sometimes, you know, as we all know, patients do get delayed in the infusion area. And then we were bumping up against the vaccine area closing at the end of the day. So there was a lot of complex scheduling coordination for cancer or patients um, that we uncovered during the pilot and also a lot of uh, clinical nuance. We had a lot of really good questions arise and obviously there weren't always easy or straightforward answers due to the lack of available data. And um, both Dr. Shulman and uh, Dr. Schuckner already touched on a lot of this, so I won't review it in detail, but uh, the most common questions were about platelet counts, uh, anticoagulation, what happens if your patient actually gets COVID in between the first and the uh, the second dose. Um, lots about allergy history, in particular uh, previous taxol reactions, which of course we see um, in our cancer patients, um, as well as concerns about pre-meds and the timing of pre-meds. And so those are the biggest questions that arose uh, during during the pilot period from a from sort of a clinical management perspective. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please. So after the 10-day period, we transitioned to a centralized management system for vaccine invitations for the health system. And uh, IS essentially Im implemented a centrally managed algorithm to identify the highest risk patients across all specialties. So that included uh, patients with uh, kidney disease, diabetes, cardiac indications, et cetera. And this really became a health system effort. Um, again, this was still for Philadelphia residents only at this time, although we do have applications pending for our uh, regional locations at both Cherry Hill and Radnor. Uh, we are trying to be more inclusive of non-Philadelphia residents, but those are not yet approved at this time. Um, so then from there, our cancer center leadership was able to work with um, IS in order to incorporate our highest risk cancer criteria into this pre-existing central prioritization algorithm. So here is sort of a summary of what we formalized for our highest risk criteria. Uh, it was at least one visit to Hemonc, Radonc, or Gynonc for a cancer diagnosis or sickle cell in the past year. Uh, any one of the following, so age over 65, uh, equal to or greater to 65, hemolignancy, metastatic solid tumor, lung cancer, and uh, systemic or radiation therapy in the last 90 days. And then for our exclusion criteria, we were able to incorporate uh, three elements, so uh, BMT within the last 90 days, CAR-T within the last 90 days, as well as COVID infection within uh, the last 90 days, and filter those out so that those uh, patients were not given uh, invitations during, uh, during the centralized management system. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. So with the transition to this system, essentially the, the current state now is that patients are sent scheduling tickets via our patient portal, which is called uh, MyPen Medicine. And so to back that up, uh, the, the primary mechanism of communicating with patients when it's their turn to schedule is a scheduling ticket via the patient portal. But to be able to back that up, we have outbound calls that are being completed for outreach to those uh, patients that aren't enrolled in MyPen Medicine or those that are enrolled but have gotten 
gotten a ticket to schedule but haven't yet actually engaged in the scheduling of the ticket. Uh, we do not have an inbound call line established for vaccinations at this time, and that's really to um, align and reinforce with our previous messaging to patients, which has essentially been, you know, don't call us, we'll call you when it's time to schedule uh, your vaccine. Um, generally speaking, with the transition to the new system, they are not accepting decentralized referrals um, for oncology patients, with the exception of some special exceptions. So, for example, um, if we have a frail elderly patient here with transportation issues, they meet the criteria, we try and work to vaccinate them uh, while they're here. And, that, and that's really consistent with um, some of the NCCN guidance that, that Larry shared earlier. Uh, we also are working on a system for the end of the day to help prevent vaccine waste, which is also consistent with some of the NCCN recommendations that uh, Larry shared, shared earlier. And the reason is, you know, once that vaccine is completely thawed, it can't go back in the fridge. Um, and so that is one scenario where the city will allow us to administer the vaccine to a non Philadelphia resident, um, as we happen to have patients that are still here at that hour receiving their infusion treatments. Um, in terms of the current issues that we're still working through with the centralized system, you know, we're really uh, relying heavily on MyPen Medicine enrollment as the key communication strategy here. We're very fortunate in oncology that our utilization of that patient portal is much higher than the rest of uh, the health system and other types of patient populations, so we're in a good starting point. But we are working on strategies as a health system to try and continue to push utilization of the patient portal as the primary mechanism for communicating with patients about vaccination. Uh, we're also trying to make our communication with patients more transparent when it is their turn to schedule. Uh, so for example, providers and care teams are now able to see in our EMR when an attempt is made to contact the patient for scheduling the vaccine so they can see that they received a scheduling ticket or they can see that an outbound call was made to try and contact their patient uh, to schedule their vaccine. Uh, we have noticed um, quite a few patient requested address changes to Philadelphia residency that have happened since our health system communication that we're only able to vaccinate uh, Philadelphia residents. And so it's been interesting to observe how many patients seem to have newly moved to Philadelphia. Uh, we did have one patient even uh, call to change their address and the address given is actually the location of one of our uh, facilities. So we've been sort of working through that. Um, we've also seen challenges with patients receiving their first dose in the community at, at sort of the first place that offered them the vaccine, uh, and then they go back for their second dose, and that location no longer has adequate supply to give them their second dose. So then they come here for their dose, and we find out that, um, in fact, they're due for Moderna, but we're only offering Pfizer right now. And so we've been trying to work on facilitation for those cases and giving, uh, getting those patients to a location within Penn that is offering the type of vaccine that they need uh, to complete their sequence. We're also piloting some new phone menus at our regional sites. Um, and this is really to try and decrease the amount of inbound calls that our teams are working uh, through related to vaccination questions. So essentially at these sites, when a patient now calls, they're able to uh, listen to a message that says, if you're calling about vaccines, press one, then they're taken to a new message that essentially reiterates our current vaccination system, the invitation process, as well as where they can go for uh, more information. Go to the next slide, please. So uh, the next slide is just an overview of where we are in terms of the locations that we're able to vaccinate patients right now. Um, you can see we're still in uh, phase one and we're, we're getting ready to transition to phase two, hopefully soon. Um, so essentially right now we're, we're offering vaccinations to patients at all of our downtown hospitals, Chester County Hospital, Lancaster General, as well as Princeton. Um, and then we, we hope to have the approval to vaccinate patients soon at our Cherry Hill and Radnor facilities, and then phase three would be ultimately the ability to try and vaccinate patients um, in our primary care practices. Go to the next slide, please. So the last two slides are just a little bit about what our communication strategy to patients has been through, uh, through all of this. And so um, you can see that in mid-December, we had the, uh, the EUAs go through for the COVID vaccines. And at that time, we began uh, employee vaccination. Um, our communication to patients initially was, we don't have any plans to vaccinate patients at Penn Medicine at this time. Um, in late December, we continued to see a really incredibly high volume of 
calls and messages um, from cancer patients regarding COVID vaccines, um, but we still had minimal cancer-specific guidance from the NCCN and CDC at that time. Um, in the first week of January, we began uh, our first communication, mass communication to oncology patients at Penn uh, via our patient portal. And um, essentially, it just gave some very general high-level information about the vaccine. Um, on the 21st of January was the first day of our oncology patient uh, pilot for cancer center patients that were Philadelphia residents. Um, and we continued to see a really high volume of inquiries during the pilot period. Um, our clinic staff began to do outreach to patients regarding COVID vaccination. Um, and our pilot really continued uh, through the first week of February. And then um, in the first week of February, we worked on mass distribution of a COVID vaccination uh, FAQ document. And we've tried to, uh, in conjunction with our marketing partners, get that out to patients via a variety of ways. And so we've been able to push communication about that document via our patient portal. We've uploaded that document to our Abramson Cancer Center webpage. Um, and we've also worked on and continuing to work on this week, making sure that message is distributed across all of our cancer care locations uh, through MyPed Medicine. Go to the next slide, please. Um, so this is just a little overview of what is actually in that patient communication regarding vaccination. And so it's really um, essentially divided into two parts. The first part is cancer-specific information about vaccination. And so uh, during that portion of the document, we're really talking about um, you know, COVID vaccination is safe for all patients re receiving immunotherapy, chemotherapy, targeted therapy. Um, and as Lynn and Larry talked about, we're, we're really trying to drive home the message that regardless of your treatment type, vaccination is still recommended. Um, and we talk a little bit about how the, you know, the vaccine is safe, um, but the effectiveness might be different depending on your disease, uh, specific disease and the specific uh, treatment that you're receiving. Um, it talks about, you know, cancer patients as a high priority population uh, and, and goes into uh, some of Penn Medicine's limited ability to vaccinate patients beyond Philadelphia at this time uh, and really reinforces the message that we will contact you uh, when, when we're able to schedule you. And so um, trying to, to reinforce that message as much as we can. And Lynn talked about this a little bit, but really trying to reinforce the message about cancer patients on active therapy those patients have to call the uh, the care team so that we know if they get a fever after they've received the vaccine. Um, because if they're on active treatment, we might need to figure out, you know, what else might be going on, um, even though it, you know, it seems likely that that would be vaccine related rather than something else. We still have to sort of work through that um, differential diagnosis. And so, um, the document also includes just some general COVID vaccine information. So reinforcing again, how it works, the importance of following up and actually getting that second dose of the vaccine, regardless of side effects experienced, um, what the common side effects experienced are, um, the fact that you cannot get COVID from the vaccine, um, that tends to be a big question, both among patients and staff, as well as providing them additional resources should they want more information. So that's just a summary of what our communication strategy has been um, to patients so far. And I think that concludes um, my presentation and the whole presentation. And so I, I think we'll move to questions right now. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you. So there was a question that just came up and it comes from Trish who asked, what was the percentage of employees who agreed to be vaccinated when offered the opportunity? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So I haven't uh, I haven't seen the data on that in about two weeks, but um, I did see the data about two weeks ago broken down by um, by race, and there were um, as as expected some pretty significant disparities that we've been working through. But um, in terms of our white employees, it tended the rate was about seventy five percent. Our Asian employees, it was about eighty percent acceptance. Um, and our Hispanic employees, it was about uh, mid 40s um, from a percentage standpoint, and then about 30 to 35 percent acceptance amongst our uh, African American employees. And so we've been working on a lot of strategies as a health system uh, in terms of uh, working on um, some of the, the racial disparities that were observed in, expect, in acceptance rates. Um, and, I, and I believe our intent is to try and apply those learnings uh, as well to our, to our patients in terms of acceptance rates. 
We have any other questions for our speakers? Oh, looks like we do. If a patient from the outside Philly gets a dose of extra vaccine, are they able to get a second dose? We we are following through on our you know commitment um, in terms of if they for a patient that uh, is non Philadelphia and they happen to be one of the fortunate ones um, who there's there happens to be unused dose that night and they are able to receive a vaccine we are then scheduling them for their second dose even though they're a non Philadelphia resident. Do we have any other questions for any of our speakers? Um, let me jump in here. I know we have some people from all of the sites, and I was wondering if anyone from our Cancer Network sites would like to share what your experience has been, and because I know uh, our centers have started to roll out the availability. Um, anybody from Bay Health or Virtua um, or St. Mary's on the line that wants to talk about this? Don't be shy. Um, Cindy, we also have another question coming in from one of the speakers. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Can we go into that one? Sure, so and the question is asking, can you review recommendations for patients scheduled for recovering from surgery? Sure, I'll take that. <clears throat> um, so the recommendation is to, um, if, you're, if someone's having major surgery, to wait two weeks post-surgery to get the first dose of vaccine. Now, that's not always gonna be possible. And I think the main issue there is this concern of fever. So if somebody had a surgery and they had a post-op fever, I was doing consenting yesterday here, and there was a patient who a week ago had mitral valve surgery. And his cardiologist and surgeon I don't know if they knew that guidance, but they wanted him to get the vaccine because there was a slot and he was very frail. And so we vaccinated him. So I think it's sort of a soft thing. It's, there's nothing about efficacy. Uh, I think it's more about confusion of a post-operative period. And I just want to say, I can't, like, living through what Lindsay said about the pilot, like, it's, like, it looks so organized and so thoughtful <laughs> what we were doing. So I really appreciate you um putting that together and um go ahead Len. No, go ahead larry no i was just going to echo that i mean i think it was amazing as lindsay said you know we had about 12 hours uh to figure this all out the first day and um you know we got people vaccinated and that was the bottom line to get as many people vaccinated as possible and you know lindsay and lynn and so many others really just did an incredible job maximizing the benefit to our patients. So to Peggy's question, and this is, you know, one of the, I think the important reasons why we're having this um, webinar is that I do, I discuss vaccine with every patient that comes into clinic. And I'm asking them to go to their county website or, I mean, Virtua has done an amazing job of staffing large, uh, vaccine centers in New Jersey, but we have been asking our patients to go on every website and to do their best to get an appointment and then see what see what happens. But I do think that providers should be having this conversation with their patients about the strong recommendation and wherever they get it and whichever vaccine. I think as the J&J &J becomes available, you know, the efficacy of the J&J &J vaccine, so I'm showing you also really effective at preventing hospitalizations and death. So I just want as a community that we're being very proactive about encouraging the vaccine and using, yes, every county hospital system resource and now drugstores, um, which I think is gonna be helpful as well. I think we're coming to the end of our hour and I just- Can I make one more point? So please, I just wanted absolutely. to mention, sorry, that the monoclonal antibody and monoclonal antibodies for patients with um, COVID and cancer is, I mean, the data are getting, um, you know, more impressive about the value of getting the monoclonal antibody, the Lilly product or the Regeneron product for sim patients who have COVID who have symptoms. Um, and the criteria, once you add cancer in there, 
you, the, our cancer patients meet the criteria for the monoclonal antibody. So it's also to know in your region who's giving it. Like for us, we're giving it a PCAM, but we're not giving it all of our sites. So I think also important to know where can you send your patients for the monoclonal antibody because I think it really, the data are very clear about helping to reduce, again, hospitalizations and ER visits by getting the monoclonal antibodies. This is for people who are symptomatic COVID-19 infections. Thank you, Dr. Schechter. Thank you, Dr. Shellman and Lindsay. I appreciate your time, everyone, for being with us today. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.